Well, this is what you've been waiting for, right? This is when the series kicks into high gear, as Rosemine leaves the safety of childhood to venture into the real world of nobles where magic and politics reign supreme, not just in her home duchy of Arenfest, but in the entire country of Jürgenschmidt. But how have things changed in the last two years? And is she even going to be able to keep up with her classes in the Royal Academy? There's certainly a lot of questions, so let's go ahead and get the obligatory subscribe animation out of the way. And with that, let's go ahead and get into Part 4, Volume 1, founder of the Royal Academy's so-called Library Committee. The prologue begins from Ferdinand's perspective to sort of round out the epilogue from last volume. Here's the actual conversation with Rosemine now that she's cleaned up and laying limp on a bench in her chambers, because she can't even sit up. Since no one slept as long as her and Adriv, he wants to use this opportunity to study her, but she's having none of it. Also, pretty much everything she wants to know is Archduke business, which means it's not safe to discuss in her chambers openly. So they move to her hidden room, with Ferdinand wondering what it'll take to get Rosemine back to 100%, as Fran and Zom carry her in, and the discussion kicks off. She says she's feeling like Udashima Taro with this whole situation, that's even the title of the next chapter. It's a Japanese folktale about a guy who went to the Dragon Palace under the sea for a few days, and when he came back up, like, a hundred years had passed. So, pretty apt for her. Ferdinand looks generally the same, but Monica and Nicola have come of age, Gil hit puberty, and everyone else just looks older. Ferdinand's keeping it a secret for now that Wilfried and Charlotte are both bigger than her now too, and by quite a bit. And the emotions start to pour out as the dam breaks, with her being scared of how different things are now. In her mind, she hasn't changed at all, but Ferdinand tells her that her mana flow has changed quite a bit. Without as many mana clumps, her flow is much easier and faster, on top of an increased capacity from the last two years. She compares it to pouring water from a bucket now. After she gets her emotions under control, she asks in all earnestness what happened over the last two years. We covered this at the end of part three with most of those side stories, but here's Rosemine learning about who attacked her, Charlotte being safe, their help at the spring prayer, Felina's help in the playroom, Elvira's involvement in the printing industry, and Daniel's failed proposal to Bridget. The new information comes from the Archduke Conference, where they used the attack on Rosemine to block Georgine's visit, and Lamprex ended engagement. He wanted to marry an arch noble from Arnsbach when he was in school, and she graduated last winter, so hey, they could now finally get married. But Sylvester wasn't approving that marriage now that Arnsbach was on their shit list. So yeah, it was declined. With most of her questions answered, but Ferdinand being unable to answer the ones about the lower city and orphanage, he encourages her to ask her attendants. Despite her worry that they're all different now, he tells her that they've been waiting faithfully for her to awaken. After all, he gets her worry, but he sympathizes more with those who had to wait for two years. So back to Rosemine's perspective, she announces she'll get things back to normal starting tomorrow. Assuming something can be done about her inability to move, Ferdinand has some ideas about that though, so he gives her a book from the stack that Gil left while she was asleep and goes back to his workshop to fetch some things. Unfortunately for her, she's literally too weak to even read, since turning the page is a chore and she can't support the book itself. So it falls to the ground and she flops on over on the bench trying to grab it. But now she can't even lift her arm up using her own strength. This is even worse than when she first became mine because books are right in front of her and she still can't read them because her body is now even weaker. She cries and Ferdinand returns just in time to see her in such a sad state. He sighs then slaps a magic tool bracelet around her upper arm and now she can suddenly move it. These are magic tools used for physical enhancement magic. Ferdinand made them when he was experimenting with the theory behind physical enhancement a while ago, so these will work out just perfect since Rosemine has an abundance of mana. Hey, now she can read books, so she's pretty stoked. Ferdinand gives her two more for her legs and tells her to put those on later, but she asks him to do it now because might as well, right? He cringes because they need skin contact to work, and he's not about that exhibitionist lifestyle, but she gets annoyed back because he didn't tell her that first. She kicks him out and has him call Monica and Nicola in to put them under her socks, which they do, and now Rosemont can walk. Hooray. Wow, talk about no consequences, right? Not even a chapter in and the main character's crippling disability is fixed with magic. So did you think something like that? Because it's not quite right. These specific tools are a stopgap. Without them, she can't even walk at the moment, and they're gonna interfere with her life later on, so... It's not quite that easy. Especially if she ends up relying on them, because they'll cripple her later in life if she doesn't rehabilitate her body. So there's drawbacks, that's all I'm saying. She strolls on out of her room, and her attendants are all pleasantly surprised to see she's up and walking. She thanks Ferdinand, and he informs her that she's leaving in three days to go to the castle to cram for the Royal Academy. Now, she doesn't really want to, because she's in rough shape. 
Ferdinand's crazy expectations are probably going to kill her at this rate, so she tries to convince him to push it back a year, but Ferdinand tells her that's a bad idea since it'll prolong her becoming a noble, make marriage even harder, and will be yet another stain on her reputation. She counters saying she already has plenty of those since, you know, she was raised in the temple according to her backstory, so her reputation's, uh, kinda dog shit anyway. But he goes in for the killing blow. Charlotte, her little sister, is already taller than her. What pride will she have left as an older sister if she's in the same grade as Charlotte? Well, that's decided then. She's going now. She'll just have to cram to ensure that she maintains Charlotte's respect. With that, Ferdinand leaves, and her attendants all gather to give their reports. Again, this is all stuff we're aware of. Fran, Zom, and Monica all managed her chambers, told her how Charlotte and Wilfried helped during spring prayer, but that also had an effect on the Blue Priests. They're now somewhat more motivated to do work in the temple. That way they can earn the Archduke's favor. And Zom mentions that Ferdinand's potion use has been a problem again, so she needs to help sort that out. Nicola then tells her how the kitchen's been, that Hugo and Ella want to get married, and she's shocked it's Ella Hugo wants to get married too. But she goes ahead and gives her a blessing for it. There's also now been two competitions for the Italian restaurant recipes, and Hugo and Lise have both won once. So, there's going to be a tiebreaker at some point. Now Wilma and Rosina step forward to give their report on the orphanage. This here is showing that Wilma is no longer afraid of the noble section of the temple. They tell her about Lily's baby and she briefly debates whether she should be mad, but realizes that's probably normal in this world and decides to let somebody else debate the ethics. But uh, everything else has been going pretty well in the orphanage. Now with Gil in the workshop, Lutz and Tuli now have good enough manners to be presented to a med noble. So they're growing, and the five books that have been printed so far are more night stories, Effa's bedtime stories, as well as the cookbook and two volumes of etiquette. Elvira's books that she had the workshop make were all taken by her so Ferdinand wouldn't happen upon any, even the misprints. Rosemind's informed just how Haldenzell is going. With her caught up to speed, she's thrown into bed by Fran and handed a stack of boards. They've already let the Gilberta and Planton Company know that she's awake and scheduled meetings for them to come. The boards that she was handed were a syllabus of sorts, with all the shit she'll need to know before she leaves for the Royal Academy. Rosemind has about a month to learn the basics of the whole country's history, dedication whirl, whatever the fuck that is, and she's getting some physical training with Bonifatius. Yeah. Now she's worried she won't even make it to the academy. The next day, she's back at her usual temple routine. Daniel's there and looking like an actual adult now. She thought the exhaustion that he's been showing might have been because his marriage fell through, but no. That's kind of ancient history for him at this point. He's tired because Pontifadius is too busy making him his bitch every day. But Cornelius and Angelica have really shot through the roof in terms of power, all because of Rosemine's mana compression and Bonifatius' training since he's now personally training all the Archducal family's guard knights. For her spiel, Rosemine's a bit worried since her fingers are out of practice, which probably feels pretty weird to her. Rosina tells her not to, though. Since Ferdinand's lesson plans were so damn difficult, she's not going to embarrass herself, at least as soon as she's back in the rhythm of things. Once done there, she heads to Ferdinand to help with math, and then goes and makes her rounds around the temple to let everyone know she's okay. And the next day is a meeting with the planting company. She goes into her hidden room right away and leaps into Lutz's arms. He's so much taller now and seems like a capable working man, probably due to his constant busyness as well as his skills being honed while she was asleep. Benno throws some nice salt in her freshly opened wound here, asking if she actually shrunk while she was asleep. And after some heartfelt reunion action, they get down to it. And Benno tells her how things have been going on the business side of printing. Aldenzel struggled to make metal letter types, so they're going to have to go back in spring and finish up. But mostly, Benno's just happy that his human shield is back to handle nobles for him, because Elvira really kicked his ass. So they decide to end it there with her giving Lutz a letter to her family. But he doesn't know what to do with it. He's living with Benno now that he has a new storefront, and Tuli's living with Corina. So Benno tells him to drop it off later. Rosemine tacks on that she'll be going to the Royal Academy soon so she won't be around to do meetings and such, and decides to give Gil a reward for all of his hard work. She wants to pat him on the head like she used to, but he's embarrassed, and turns her down. That makes her feel sad since, again, it reminded her how she missed two years, and he humors her by leaning down to get his head pat, which hits him harder in the feels than he was expecting. <laughs> Man, poor Gil. He just accidentally nuked his source of childhood validation. 
Hey, it's already time to go to the castle. So Rosamine packs up her crew and her panda bus, and Ferdinand loads a bunch of paperwork because he's going to be working from the castle to oversee her ultra-condensed lessons. When they get there, Cornelius and Angelica are waiting to greet her. They're pretty much prepared to get scolded for their massive failure, but instead Rosemine thanks them for saving Charlotte and getting Lassie's face stone for her. For Angelica, she was worried she'd end up failing while she was asleep, but Bonifatius and Cornelius barely got her to scrape by her lessons. Right as she goes to leave, Ferdinand tells her to go to his office after she gets changed into her castle guard. So she plans on hurrying to do so, but he tells her not to, because she needs to learn to act like a 10 year old lady now, though she doesn't quite get what that means. Basically, she has new expectations she's not prepared to meet, hinting at the problems she'll be facing throughout this part that she lacks the self-awareness to handle. As she leaves for her room, Ferdinand tells her to use her high beast too, even if she can walk thanks to magic tools, overexertion is bad and it'll still get her sick. She's nowhere near healthy. Just sitting up in bed is too much for her right now, so walking long distances is just asking for trouble. Wow, what's up with that big huge shadow cast by that statement? When she gets to the hallway to the northern building, she tenses up, because it was just a few days ago from her perspective that she was attacked here. Cornelius and Angelica put her at ease though, saying they felt the same way for quite some time, but assured her it was safe. Inside her room, Riarda and Otilly get her changed, and tell her just how excited everyone is that she's back. Bonifatius even came a day early, hinting to Rosemine just how goofy he actually is. She's barely spoken to him at this point, so... She doesn't realize just how much he adores her. In Ferdinand's office, he gives her a ton of books and boards full of material she'll need to learn. It's all his old notes, and newer stuff Damiel organized from the playroom. While Riarda handles getting all this crap to her room, Ferdinand sets her down and has her go over the other duchies in their ranks. I talked a lot about duchy rankings offhandedly to give context to Ehrenfest's place in the world, but part four is where duchy rankings become incredibly relevant. In this country, Jürgen Schmidt, there are currently 21 duchies. That rank is their status in the country, which is determined by the quality of nobles produced, their social influence, and their closeness to the royal family. Now this is separate from greater, middle, and lesser classifications, because that's a measure of geographical size and population. Ehrenfest is a middle duchy of a slightly below middle rank, only there due to the decline of other duchies who fell out of favor during the Civil War. Why this is important is it dictates status in the Royal Academy. So to help her, he pulls out two maps, one old and one new, showing the aftermath of the Civil War. She sees for the first time that Ehrenfest is a border duchy of decent geographical size, but on the smaller side in terms of population. It's pretty much on the edge of being a lesser duchy. She looks down south to Arnsbach and notices, hey, they border an ocean. And that revitalizes her Japanese spirit because, hey, she wants that salty Japanese cuisine. But Ferdinand is pointing out Ehrenfest's influence politically. Since they're a former low-ranking duchy, now middle, they don't have a ton of influence. But their rank is sure to rise due to how well their students have been doing in the academy as of late. Now I'm sure you're wondering, why do student grades influence their rank? It's pretty much the metric for the quality of nobles produced by a duchy. If the duchy's grades are rising, it's showing they're producing intelligent, capable nobles who will go back to work in their home duchy. On top of that, the interduchy tournament held at the end of the school year shows how the knights are doing, demonstrating the military power of a given duchy. That also influences their rank. He tells her due to her mana compression method, her guards and charlottes have performed exceedingly well during the past few years. Their trend of rising grades is sure to continue. Now, she's not all that interested, but Ferdinand tells her to strive to do well too. Since she's an Archduke candidate, she'll need to be an honor student at least. Not that she's entirely convinced given her health, because, you know, she was blackmailed into even going, and she doesn't really feel she has the leeway to, like, put in that kind of effort, so Ferdinand's gonna have to find some additional motivation. In the meantime, though, he sure does know a lot about the current state at the Royal Academy. Isn't that kind of weird? And he's confused why she's even asking. After all, she's the one who instructed students in the playroom to gather information while she was asleep. What is she? Stupid? However, since she was so vague in her request, they gathered any and all information, which different parts of society took interest in. From grades, fashion, nights, cooking, you name it. Someone wrote about it, and it ended up on Ferdinand's desk to evaluate. Too bad her original goal there was to get people to gather stories, not just intel. So what does this whole conversation mean? Ehrenfest is about to see a huge boon in terms of influence. Its paper industry means it now has a specialty product. Their Archduke candidates will be there for the next 10 years, starting with her and Wilfrey going to Charlotte, and then Melchior. That in turn motivates their students to do better. With their educational material and mana compression method, trade deals will sure to come, meaning they're going to be building political ties. And this is all thanks to the groundwork that she's been laying. Yeah, they're sitting on a huge chance here. 
They just need Rosemine to capitalize on it. And he points out that that's supposed to be her specialty. You know, raising grades from all the talk he's heard from the playroom. But she denies that, saying she just wanted more people interested in books. Ferdinand finds his motivation when talking about the Royal Academy Library, being the second largest in the country, and suddenly Rosemine is pumped to go, so she's gonna need excellent grades in order to secure her access. After a while, it's time to go get ready for dinner. Ferdinand tells her before she goes that Karstadt's family will be in attendance for the meal to celebrate her recovery. She should be sure to thank Bonifatius while he's there, since without him finding her so quickly, it's very likely she would have died from the poison. So she decides to write a letter of gratitude, for not just saving her life, but taking it upon himself to personally train the Guard Knights. Riarda is also going to be her one allotted attendant going with her to the Royal Academy, and while she thinks that's for her comfort, it's actually because she's the only person able to pull her ass out of the library. While she's getting changed, Rosemine remarks how lonely it is without Bridget there. They then explain the situation to her a bit more. It's what we already know, but it's focused on her family situation. Rather than Bridget being cut off before she could lead Daniel away to his death, she asks if a replacement adult Garden Knight has been picked yet, and there hasn't been anyone willing to step up. Most don't know her well enough, and they also weren't even sure if she'd wake up for her Jareev. However, Angelica is due to graduate, so it's pretty much fine. But on the flip side of that, she's gonna need some apprentice knights to guard her at the academy, since Angelica won't be there next year. But Rosemine's big concern over that is ruining her current dynamic. They want her to get, like, an arch knight or at least a med knight, but since everyone works so well together and Damiel isn't getting bullied despite his lower status, she's going to be careful with who she chooses. So before she goes, she writes the letter using paper with pressed flowers, because that's now for her exclusive use. The only issue is she's using her earth memories to structure the letter, but that's an issue easily brushed under the rug using her mental age as an excuse. Next, she decides to go above and beyond, folding it into an origami heart, and heads off. At dinner, she's immediately greeted by Wilfried and Charlotte. Wilfried has grown quite a bit, and not just physically. He's so much more adult-like now that his spoiled brat air has pretty much vanished. Charlotte's now much taller and thinks Rosemine shouldn't grow anymore since she's cute as is. Though that won't do since everyone's going to assume that Rosemine's the little sister here. Both of them believe they've worked hard enough to catch up to her. And while she wants to quit back that they still have a ways to go, she can't really do that in good faith yet. But despite her protest that she'll protect Charlotte, and her not taking them very seriously at all, Ferdinand backs her up for a boost of confidence. Bonifatius is waiting for his turn to talk, but she can't greet him just yet. She has to greet the Archducal couple. So she goes to Sylvester and kneels to apologize for the trouble that she's caused. But he tells her to stand. In turn, Sylvester kneels before her, causing a stir among all the staff there. He grabs her cheek and is happy that she's better, before Florencia joins him in kneeling. The two thank her for saving their children, with Sylvester pressing his forehead against Rosemine's hand, in what she assumes is a sign of great gratitude. She's pretty much speechless here, and the retainers are all panicking over the Archduke lowering himself like this, since he shouldn't do so before anyone else in their duchy, but Karstet reigns it in, so she gets permission to talk to the others from Sylvester, and almost slips up greeting Karstet and Elvira first instead of Bonifatius, who's higher in status than the Knight's commander. She timidly thanks him and presents the letter, and this pretty much causes a breakdown in communication. She explains it's a heart, and he says, uh, that's not what a heart looks like, and then she strikes a pose that pretty much shoots Bonifatius right through his. Since he's so hard to read, she thinks he hates it, and she says she can fold it into a different shape that's a little more manly. You know, one for his liking, but he's fine with the heart as a symbol of love. She takes it back so she can unfold the letter at least. That way he can read it and yeah, that's nice. But now he's staring at it like his whole damn world just came crashing down. She's worried she screwed up writing the letter, but Elvira steps in to mediate, as the two are clearly having a hard time communicating. The letter's formatted fine, but Bonifatius just wants the heart back. So she goes ahead and refolds it for him. That captures Wilfried and Charlotte's attention, and even makes Charlotte want such a letter for herself. When she hands the refolded heart letter back to Bonifatius, he's pleased, and things move on from there. She asks if he can teach her physical enhancement magic, and he's definitely down. That means he's gonna spend more time with Rosemine. Hell yeah, claiming he'll make her the strongest in all of Arenfest. But uh, that's a bit beyond her goal. So they mention teaching the mana compression method to the next group of people now that she's awake, and the people just need her approval. The only issue is she wants to wait until after socializing. Why? That way she can see how Wilfried has grown, and teach him and his guard knights if he's ready. That way any other first years will have their chance after winter, so it's a pretty smart idea. The gap between his knights and Charlotte's was clear, 
and Ferdinand agrees that this is the right decision. He tells Wilfried to stay on his toes as a leader of men, which he gives a sharp reply to. That little interaction right there shows just how close the two of them got over these last two years. It went from a single change in how he addresses Ferdinand to now looking at him as a role model. That relationship continues into the future, and it's nice. The next day begins Rosemind's personal hell, where she's not just cramming facts into that head of hers, but also harspiel practice, dedication whirl, which is a sort of dance used to praise the gods, one that she's going to have to perform when she graduates, so she's definitely going to make sure she's not putting her whole heart into it, or else she might just fire off a blessing. And then there's a bit of physical exercise under Bonifatius' supervision in the knight's training ground. She's learning enhancement magic without the tools here, and it takes her a few days to be able to form her high beast while doing so. That annoys Angelica who took ages to get that far, but Bonifatius tells her not to compare herself to a girl with enough mana to be adopted by the Archduke. They also point out she's brute forcing this, with her massive amount of mana whereas Angelica had to learn precise control. This is where they draw attention to Daniel, who has so much control over his mana he's master preserving it. Stenluke then chimes in, and that's Bonifatius' cue. He steps up to try and get Rosemine to offer mana to a mana blade that he's been raising, hoping to get another intelligent one too, but with her voice instead of Ferdinand's. However, she says that Ferdinand forbade it, on top of her saying she made Stenluke by accident while trying to cover for Angelica's weaknesses. She can't really see any that Bonifatius even has, and he's a bit dejected by that, since he won't get a Rosemine mana blade cheering him on. After that, she gets a bath, eats dinner, reads, and then sleeps. Yeah, that's her routine. So she's pretty much just blasting through the materials for the Royal Academy, with magic classes basically amounting to learning to fill and drain face stones, make a high beast, stop fundamentals, and also learn what elements are what color. Pretty basic stuff, considering she's been doing a lot of that for ages now. History is going to be the big subject she has to study for, but for ancient history, she doesn't really need to know the minutiae, just the general flow of events. The recent decades are the ones she'll need to know in detail, especially the Civil War. What changes it caused and who won? Ready for your history dump? We're finally learning what the Civil War mentioned all the way back in part one was actually about. Ferdinand shows her the royal family tree and explains that the children of the king fought over who would be the next one. Well, not entirely. We'll learn later that the second prince was the heir, but died before he could be coronated. This led to the first and third prince fighting over the throne, turning into open conflict. And how the third prince won, killing the first, but then he was assassinated, like, right after winning. Which then led to the fourth and fifth prince picking up the conflict. The fifth prince then won, and due to how bad the conflict got, he ordered the purge to kill all the nobles who sided with his brother. Okay, people have read further along, keep your spoilers to yourself. Don't put those in the comments. That right there is an oversimplification of the events, and as it's presented at this point in the story. There's more to this, but we're not going to learn about that until the second half of this part, when it becomes more relevant. And even then, you're going to have to dig into the side stories for a lot more of the picture. As Rosemine points out, this led to the country losing a lot of power. The royals just must be idiots, right? And Ferdinand agrees, but tells her she's the biggest idiot of all if she doesn't keep those sort of comments to herself. The Royal Academy is full of nobles who support the fifth prince, the now king of the country. So in the family tree, we see how the purge went down, but those killed in it denoted as such. She points out how unnecessary it was, considering many of the women killed were outside the line of succession. But Ferdinand rebuts that this was actually necessary to kill the seeds of rebellion. They don't need the rebel faction propping up anyone to go against the current king. And that situation's a lot more precarious than we know at this stage in the game. So Ferdinand ends their discussion saying that with the mana shortage, houses are currently looking for nothing but to increase their size and influence. So she'll be strapped with a bunch of magic tools for her defense. Make sure not to leave her Garden Knight's sight, cause she could be kidnapped. Her other goal before she goes is an outfit. Without any clothes to wear, since she's now 10, she's gonna have to wear longer skirts. But she also needs clothes for the academy. There's no uniform per se, but it's encouraged that students wear black to symbolize the god of darkness and willingness to absorb knowledge. So Karina, Elvira, and Florencia are getting to work on her wardrobe, using the intel students gathered at the academy about fashion so she'll stay trendy. Sylvester asks her if she's cool sending her chefs and Rosina to the academy, which she's fine with. The reason being, the castle sends their chefs to cook for the dorm. But with Rosemine going, they might as well send Hugo and Ella, who are the source of her recipes, to show off. This is him telling her the gloves are off when it comes to broadcasting Aaron Fest's new cultural revolutions. He wants her to raise all the grades of the duchy, introduce trends, 
and showcase their new cooking. But she hits back saying that she really doesn't have time to prep for all that, and she'll use this year to best gauge how to spread things. She's still gonna introduce stuff, but next year is when they'll kick things into gear. So with that, Sylvester says he's leaving it to her and Wilfrey to lead Ironfest into prosperity. Time sure flies, because it's already winter, meaning baptisms, debuts, and the now important gifting ceremony for Rosemine. Since she has to attend that, Ferdinand will perform the usual rituals, so she's just gonna attend as the Archduke's daughter. So she meets up with Charlotte and Wilfried and heads to the hall. They're surprised she's still using her high beast despite being healthy now, but she says she's still relying on magic tools to move and will do so until she gets back from the academy. They're surprised because she's been doing so well in dedication role practice, and also wasn't she training with Bonifatius? But yeah, that's all thanks to the tools. So if they could keep that all secret for her, that'd be great. They get to the Grand Hall for the ceremonies and Charlotte and Wilfried have been told to stick to Rosemine like glue. The first two who approach their group is Guy Groeschel and his daughter Brunhilda, who's excited to go to the Royal Academy with Rosemine. Since they're named and I'm talking about them, they're important. Rosemine thanks Brunhilda for the fashion information as she remembers her from the playroom, but Charlotte steps between them and handles the conversation from there. Next, Vice Countess Daldoff steps up, and Wilfried does the same. The two viewers might remember this person, yeah, it's Sheik's his mom, so we know she's horrible. As more nobles come up, this trend continues, where as long as Rosemine doesn't insert herself into the conversation, Charlotte and Wilfried deflect. Yeah, it's the complete reverse of two years ago. She comments how far they've come, and thanks them for their help with the religious work, knowing Ferdinand must have drilled them pretty hard on all this stuff, but they brush it off saying it was well worth the effort. And they'll be helping with the ceremonies from now on as children of the Archduke. So now it's time for the baptisms, and Ferdinand comes in. During it though, Cornelius leans down and whispers to her that there's a boy named Nicholas among the kids. He's Garstedt's son from his second wife, you know, their half-brother, but true to lead his mother, is from the former Veronica faction. Karstedt's word of warning here is to not show him favoritism, even if he's her half-brother. Now Rosemine wants to dote on him because, you know, he's family, but she can't because her social priorities are Wilfried and Charlotte, then her full brothers from Elvira, so Nicholas is pretty low on her list. Once that's all done, Sylvester calls up all the students for the academy and hands out their capes and brooches. She's lined up with all the same kids from her baptism, but they're all much taller now, so she feels like shit. After lunch, she shooed off to her room to rest for the day, despite social obligations because, you know, her health is more important. Though the fact that she was supposed to be greeted by Nicholas and Trudely probably had something to do with that decision. But she lays out her plans for the next day, greeting the new children in the playroom, and in the afternoon she'll go to his office and hand out payments for those who graduated from the academy. You know, for the people who supplied information during her sleep, the students still in the academy will be given compensation at the academy, so everybody's getting paid. Rosemine's also collected the money from the relevant parties already, as all the info's been found valuable by different aspects of the government, with some even requesting follow-up reports. Charlotte's a little annoyed that she's planning on handling the playroom again. Basically, Rosemine's gonna take over, but her and Wilfried have been leading the playroom for two years at this point, longer than Rosemine did, and she's too busy preparing for the Royal Academy to take on additional work. Basically, Charlotte's saying, let her handle it. She even has to remind her that Sylvester told them it's their duty as children of the Archduke to ensure the Duchy's grades all go up. So with that, they tell her to go rest, and she gladly does, with Ferdinand even giving her the blessing to read in bed, since she has so many damn things to learn still. But one thing is clear, the nobles during the ceremony were not looking at her with friendly eyes. They were curious, and even a few were scornful, so she's gonna need to be on guard. In the playroom the next day, she's shoved to the front by Wilfrey where he tells all the kids who don't recognize her, since only those her age and older would know her, that she's the inventor of the toys, books, and even amazing sweets. Charlotte goes up and doubles down on these bold claims, saying even as she slept, Rosemine blessed the duchy with her mana, calling her the Saint of Arenfest, and says she has her utmost respect. So, yeah, Rosemine wants to run away after all that talking up, but she still has to greet these kids properly. So she does with Nicholas getting a standard response, making her question whether she did the right thing, only for Cornelius to give her a stern reminder of his warning. Once things settle into a rhythm, she sees it's progressing smoothly. Maritz approaches and tells her how it's been going and some of the setbacks they had, but now that they've got a grip on it, the playroom is now accomplishing its job she set out for it. Aside from her wanting to increase the difficulty again to ensure these future students do well in the academy. But as she watches the kids who have clearly broken into Wilfred and Charlotte factions, Felina calls out to Rosemine. She's holding some documents to her chest. Rosemine smiles, asking if she can see her stories. 
As she looks over them, she comments how far Felina's come, and Felina's just happy Rosemine included her mom's stories in the Knight's collection, though she's saddened that some of the stories her mom told her she's forgotten about, so she's never going to get to hear them again. Rosemine tells her that stories have similar patterns though, and she might just hear some in the academy from other duchies that would jog her memory, so you know, she could seek some out. Felina catches on that Rosemine's plan is to gather stories from other duchies in the Royal Academy, and she vows as an apprentice scholar to carry out her will. Students all rush over in a buzz, asking if Rosemine's accepted Felina as her retainer, but Cornelia shoots that all down, saying she's only granting Rosemine's wish, but isn't her retainer as of yet, so that leads to them asking if she has her retainers chosen. And no, she doesn't yet. She'll announce who at the Academy, so that puts that discussion on ice. When she gets back to her room, she asks Riarda if people have been chosen. And yeah, there's a list of candidates who fit their criteria. Rosemine only has five retainers at this point, and that's abysmally low for an Archduke candidate. The apprentice attendants that she had that weren't even named were let go during her long sleep because they didn't know when she was going to wake up. And not even knowing if your master is going to wake up is pretty much a political death sentence. Your work tends to inform the type of person you're going to marry for a woman. And yeah, that even extends to people still in the academy. Plus, women just generally quit their jobs when they get married to have children. Uh, in this world. Let me clarify that. So Rosemine heads to Ferdinand's office to give out payments. And the people there are sweating bullets because he didn't tell them why to show up. Just, you know, do it. And when the Archduke's brother is the one giving that order, yeah, they gotta come. But she puts them at ease, gives them some praise about their information, and they're all looking much more comfortable when they walk out the door. She then gets back to studying and asks Ferdinand if she's really ready for the Royal Academy based on the material she's looking over. And he simply states that she'll pass, but passing isn't really enough here. This is an investment in the future. And while she takes that to mean her future, he was kind of vague there. After a few more days, it's her turn to go to the academy. Since they leave in the order of older students first to prepare the dorm, and the first year's arriving last. She's seen off by pretty much her whole family who's not there already. So, minus Cornelius. They give her some last minute warnings with Ferdinand telling her to be sure to return for the dedication ritual. So she'll need to make sure she passes all of her classes by then. She thinks that's unreasonable, but that was part of his future investment over preparing her so she could pass her classes on the first day. What a devious asshole. With that, she teleports with Riarda and enters the Royal Academy proper. On the other side of the teleportation circle, she has to clear away, so her crap can be taken to her room for prep, and Wilfried's gonna be coming right behind her. So she enters the common room of the dorm, and is greeted by the older classmen who prepared a small tea party for the first years. The Arenfest dorm is modeled after the castle, because it was created by a now-deceased Archduke, so chances are it's gonna share a lot in terms of style with the Duchy's castle. Now, the brooch she received during the gifting ceremony was actually a magic tool that would allow her to enter the dorm, and they're pretty complicated. Enough that even stealing one isn't gonna allow someone to enter another duchy's dorm. Cornelius and Angelica guard her as Brunhilde guides her to a seat at the front of the room, while Riarda leaves to oversee her room prep. As soon as she's inside and seated, a whirl of students swarm around her. Brunhilde offers her some tea while complimenting her outfit, and starts to talk about how she wishes to spread Aaronfest hairpins and food trends throughout the academy. But Sylvester had forbid it while Rosemine was asleep. Another attendant pops up at this point, and shines Brunhilde for only talking about her own interests. This is Lisa Letta, an apprentice attendant med noble who bears a striking resemblance to Angelica, but uh, with green instead of blue hair and eyes. Rosemine notes the resemblance to Angelica, and Angelica confirms that she's her little sister. But unlike Angelica, she followed in her parents' footsteps and became an attendant. She's damn skilled at it too. While Angelica couldn't really do attendant work, she's skilled as a knight and in steps another girl to support Angelica on how amazing she is. I mean, hell, she's a med knight with a mana blade who has as much mana as an arch noble and is a protege to Bonifatius. And despite her dog shit grades, she was selected to perform the sword dance at the graduation ceremony, a role usually only taken by arch noble honor students. This girl is Judith, the daughter of Gieb Kernberger, and also a second year apprentice knight. She idolizes Angelica who showed just how far a med knight can climb, though uh, she doesn't quite understand just how lacking in intelligence and motivation Angelica is yet, and Angelica isn't too keen on being idolized either, since she views Judith as pretty damn weird. So there's a reason I brought these characters up by name, a brief history about who they are, and some of their family names should probably ring a bell by this point. Brunhilde from Groschel and Judith from Kernberger both made cameo appearances back in part 3 in the playroom. 
but something draws Rosamine's attention. A group of kids is sitting away from the rest, all looking sad as hell. Cornelius fills us in that these are the kids of the former Veronica faction, who are now thoroughly ostracized after the Ivory Tower incident. They're on the shit list and can't be taken as retainers. But for Rosemine, that just won't do. She was instructed to bring up the grades of everyone in the duchy, not just her faction. She asks if there's anything they can do to get them on their side, but Cornelius says that's just how factions work. Ferdinand faced similar isolation when he attended the academy, with his retainers being selected by the former Archduke, and really, Veronica herself. Wilfried arrives next, and he comments as well how much the dorm looks like the castle, but a voice behind them agrees, which makes Rosemine and Wilfried turn around to see a very serious looking woman behind them. This is her shirt, the dorm supervisor of Arenfest. Now she's a sovereignty noble, but hailing from Arenfest originally after her grades got her an offer to join. She's also a teacher of the scholar course and has some mad scientist vibes because she's Ferdinand's former teacher. This is the person who turned him into such a research-obsessed mad scientist type. And since she's close to Ferdinand, he contacted her and told her about Rosemind, so she's fairly interested in his prized disciple. She explains the basic rules of the dorm, how the third floor is for women, second is for men, and no men can go up to the third floor without some severe punishment. The furthest rooms on each are for the Archduke and Archduchess respectively, and if you fail, you're gonna have to attend classes during spring with them while they're at the Archduke conference so they'll be sure to remember your failure of a face. The Royal Academy works on a system of half bells, because a single bell, which I'm not really sure I've ever talked about, it's the timekeeping metric for this world, and it rings about every two or three hours. So the half bells allow for more precise time measurement and for shorter classes. For Rosemind, she learns that the library opens on the first day of class, but registration requires some gold, and students need to schedule a time slot with the librarian, and it goes in the order of their duchy's rank. The advancement ceremony is in a few days, which marks the start of classes, but also has a fellowship gathering that requires the Archduke candidates to have an audience with the sitting royal at the academy. Now she's attending with the second prince, who's in his last year at the academy. With that all dumped on us, Riarda comes and tells Rosemine her room is ready, so she bails. She heads up with Angelica and Riarda sets down a list in front of her. On it are names, and how preferable they'd be as retainers. Ranked from all clear to not so great, and then absolutely not. Hey, and since I drew attention to some of those names earlier, you can probably guess who's going to be chosen. So Rosemine goes down her list. Brunhilda, Lizaletta, and Judith all have an all clear. So, she chooses them, obviously. Felina she pushes for, despite her being a lay noble. And Roderick, a boy who'd been gathering stories for her in the playroom while Rosemine was asleep. But he's not allowed at all. Yeah, he's from the former Veronica faction and tricked Wilfried into going into the ivory tower personally. Riarda accepts Felina under the condition that she has an arch-noble scholar to train and support her. There's only one available though, and it's Hartmut. Now, who's Hartmut? That's Attili's son, her other adult attendant back at the castle. So he's got a connection in, but Hartmut's lost his fucking mind over Rosemine, completely buying her whole sainthood bullshit. But she and Riarda don't know that quite yet. Don't worry, it won't take too long. So he's loyal enough, and she gives him the okay. But she's a little light on guard night still. So Riarda suggests her grandson, Traugat, who's also Bonifatius' grandson, and her cousin. He declined serving Wilfried because he wanted to serve Rosemine, so she chooses him as well. But there's an issue here. Judith is a fine replacement for Angelica, but Angelica teaching is like trying to mix oil and water. It's just not gonna happen. Angelica suggests Leonor, a massive air quotes friend of Cornelius to train Judith and serve as a guard knight herself since she's a fourth year. Great. So Riarda probes the women while Cornelius probes the men to see if they're interested in serving Rosemine. Now normally an attendant would do that, but she doesn't have any male attendants. So it falls on Cornelius, and that pretty much covers her retainers. So everyone accepted and all the women moved into chambers close to hers to serve her, but why would they all agree? Rosemine's pretty unappealing from conventional noble logic, being absent for two years, weak in body, and also raised in the temple. But we get some of those answers. Brunhilda loves Arenfest and wants it to be a trendsetter. Lisa Letta is grateful that Rosemine saved Angelica and considers it a matter of course that she'd repay that debt that allowed her sister to remain on track to become a noble. Riarda takes those two as their attendants and begins running them through their jobs. Next comes the knights, Leonor and Judith. Leonor is basically thrown into the thick of it, having to keep an eye on Angelica and also get Judith up to speed on what she needs to do. But Judith's just incredibly excited to serve Rosemine and also work with her dear senpai. And last to step forward is Felina, the first year lay scholar who normally wouldn't be chosen in a million years to serve an Archduke candidate. So yeah, she's pretty nervous. But Rosemine took her for a reason. 
Felina showed loyalty over these past two years while she was asleep, so she just wants her to keep doing Mestinor's work. With the female retainers having been told what their jobs are, Rosemine talks to Felina about the Better Grades Committee, which is her idea to implement Sylvester's plan. How so? Easy. Break everyone into years and courses, and have them support one another in studying. Older students will build guides for younger students and make the job easier for the next year. Yeah, basically it's just study groups. Now, it's tradition for archnobles with older siblings and archduke candidates to pass their classes on the first day for their first year, so Rosemine's expecting to do this as well, which will allow her quicker access to the library. Now, they're able to do this with the notes from their relatives, so expanding that to be a common resource would help out immensely with the entire duchy's grades. But all this faction bullshit's in the way of that. So just like with the playroom, factions aren't going to be a factor. The reason they crept back in at all is because Wilfried was tricked into the ivory tower and Rosemine was attacked. The former Veronica faction children were all excluded and isolated because of it. She's correcting that to help with the whole duchy's grades. And just maybe, that'll allow these kids to fold over into their faction when they reach adulthood and can choose for themselves. So during dinner, she sits with her new retainers, and the food is getting rave reviews this year because Hugo and Ella are in the kitchen. On top of that, Rosemine is planning to sell her new recipe book. Great, but she has to explain to Brunhilde they have to introduce trends slowly, or else they're not going to be adopted. Aaronfest is the 13th ranked duchy, so they're going to have to conduct themselves as med nobles essentially, at least when they're talking among their peers. After dinner, she has things to tell the whole dorm, like her retainer selection, greeting them properly, so Traug got kneels and swears loyalty. That's good for a fucking laugh. Then Hartmut steps up, and he's already been gathering a ton of intel for her because Hartmut is incredibly good at his job. Next, she gets some coins to throw at people who gathered information for her at the academy while she was asleep. She calls up Roderick, which throws everyone off, since, you know, he's one of the kids who tricked Wilfried. Speaking of, he tries to chide her for rewarding him, but she hits back saying good deeds deserve rewards regardless of faction. No one else from the former Veronica faction brought information to Rosemine, and she thought initially that was because the parents told them not to, but no. It was actually because they didn't think she'd pay them for their efforts. Now they know better. <laughs> which is a good segue to the Better Grades Committee. She broaches the topic of everyone working together, and says they need to consider what would help everyone raise their grades. And the knights jump up to immediately say her compression method would help immensely, but she simply dodges by saying she'll gradually teach those who are trustworthy. So they're happy to know that, but she does tell them that there's a hefty fee involved. So she moves on, saying she wants to focus on written scores for now, and breaks everyone into groups regardless of faction. Wilfried pipes up again, but also some of the students from the respective factions. She shuts them down, stating in the Royal Academy, Factions and parental squabbles don't matter. The whole country considers Aaronfest a backwater with nothing of note. They need to focus on building up their duchy together. Wilfried tries to ask if she's forgotten that she was attacked, and she tells him that she hasn't, and no, she's not happy about it, but they have bigger fish to fry when they're at the Academy so all this faction crap can wait until they're home. To get everyone motivated, she throws in some sweets recipes. Whichever team passes their classes first, and whichever passes with the highest marks, will receive the recipe for pound cake. That's the bait, and the motivation is competition. So Rosemine says that with the easier material and the leg up already from the playroom, she expects the first years to pass first to him with the highest grades. But the knights aren't so sure with Cornelius and Angelica there, but Rosemine drops a bombshell. Since Angelica's become even lazier while she was asleep, she's been relying on Stenluke too much, so Rosemine forbids her from using him during class. And also, she can't guard her until classes are complete. Yeah, now the knights are sweating. So with that, the plans until the advancement ceremony are settled. The next day, everyone's studying. And as Rosemine's going over what her classes will cover, she realizes she's already pretty much passing everything. Yeah, even the dedication world. The other first years are struggling with geography and history, and that's her cue to add those to the playroom for next year. Hersher swings by to tell them the advancement ceremony is tomorrow, and not to bother her too much since she's busy researching, as well as give them the reminder for their rank and asks the Archduke candidates to manage the dorm for her. Turns out this is pretty much the most anyone's seen of Hersher in years because well, she rarely stops by. The fact she's showing her face so much is out of respect for the Archduke candidates in the dorm. Even if Wilfried's annoyed she didn't even kneel and greet him like he feels she should've. But that's where he's mistaken. For starters, she's not an Aaronfest noble, she's a sovereignty noble. Second, for the sake of running the school, professors outrank students during the school year. Well, in theory. In practice, Archnoble students still ignore the request of Med Noble professors. Fast forward until the ceremony, and it's the first year's first time leaving the safety of the dorm. Rosemine made sure all the girls used Rinsham in their hair so it's all nice and shiny. That way they'll stand out and do a bit of advertising. 
Along the way to the auditorium, down the main hall where all the dorms are, there's a number of large doors like the one they exited from, each having a number outside. Floating out from each are groups with different colored capes. Duchy student populations range from Erinfest 65 currently, to small duchies having less than 50, and greater duchies having over 150. So the whole school has maybe 2,000 students total. Inside the hall, there's a boring speech. And afterwards, they're broken up by status for a fellowship gathering. Rosemine takes her three highest mana guards, Hartmut and Brunhilde, to the Archduke Candidate Gathering, where every duchy has their Archduke candidates attend, with the highest ranked Archnoble attending if there's no candidate at the academy for that duchy. But this year, Aaronfest has two. And this whole thing is just this, like, lengthy greeting process they have to follow, where the duchies all have to go and greet the prince and move down the line according to rank. So the first ranked duchy will greet the prince, then sit down, and then the second will greet the prince and then the first before sitting themselves, moving down the line through all 20-something duchies. Fucking kill me. Luckily, we the audience don't have to sit through that. Rosemine's getting rude comments due to her appearance, but she's pretty good at ignoring them by now, while Wilfried's frustrated because he's not too used to getting laughed at. So let's rush on through this. The first person they have to greet is the second prince, Anastasius. He's pretty much your stereotypical royal at this point in the story, feigning boredom as he comments how Rosemine is a pitiful saint. In her attempts not to upset him and just agree, she probably comes off as more sarcastic and whiny, but he dismisses them eventually and she considers that a success. Now duchies 1 through 5 aren't on bad terms at Theronfest, so those all go fine. But 6 is a problem, since that's Arnsbach. Their current Archduke candidate is Georgine's youngest daughter, Det Lind, who bears a striking resemblance to her mother, and more than likely Veronica too. She ignores and insults Rosemine throughout their entire exchange, focusing entirely on Wilfried to see if she can get close to him and maybe have him invite her to Aaronfest for some reason. We're not privy to why just yet, but stay tuned. But they skillfully dodge her at this point and get out intact. The next few duchies they greet are more on edge, since they view Aaronfest as a threat to their rank but they also dodge their insults skillfully and take their seats. Now it's time for the lower ranked duchies to go and greet them, and the ones right below are pretty antagonistic for similar reasons, but one that stands out is Frembeltag, the 15th ranked duchy, as their Archduke candidate Rudiger is the spitting image of Wilfried, but you know, older, since he's 14, mostly because his parents are Wilfried's parents' older siblings. He probes them to maintain the good relationship their duchies currently share. After the greetings are done, food is served, and uh, it's nothing special. Rosemine's food tastes better. Except when it comes to dessert because holy shit. Remember that sugar is a recent import to the country? And the sovereignty hasn't quite mastered how to incorporate it into recipes. So, it's just dumped on pretty much everything. Making it all just taste like sugar. Hartmut mentions how until recently, this food used to be the best he'd ever had. But now Aaronfest cooking is way better due to Rosemine. The only thing that's really out of this world is the presentation. So she questions that if this level of sweetness is expected in the sovereignty, will her food even catch on here? They'll have to keep their clientele's taste in mind. Hartmut's more interested in how Rosemine's gonna establish herself as a saint in the academy though. Because, spoiler, he's her most devoted sycophant. He's been spreading her legend for years. She's not about that life though, but he's not really taking no for an answer because he truly believes that she's a saint. He first witnessed her glory at her baptism, when Otilly took him to introduce the new lady that she'd be serving. Then there's the blessing she fired off during her debut, her saving Wilfried from disinheritance when she could've just disposed of him, and taken the seat of Archduke for herself, only solidified this image in his head, that she wants everyone elevated. <laughs> now Rosemine's worried she took someone that maybe she shouldn't have for a retainer. That's not just a fear that's justified, it's one that's gonna keep coming back again and again, as Hartmut went from a very respectable noble to the type of guy commissioning paintings of her behind her back. Yeah. All right, on top of holding sermons espousing her virtues to people. I think it's time we speed things up because we're only like halfway through this book, and you can see how long this video is already, but the groundwork's been pretty much laid, so let's go ahead and do it. The rest is just classes with some setup for events that'll pay off a lot later in the part. So the first day of classes is math, theology, and the basics of mana control. Rosemine has to argue with Cornelius about using her free time for the library, but he's not budging. So she's not gonna basically be living there like she wants. And he's not the only one against her doing this, as Wilfried also had to rein her in. And Riarda drops the bombshell that she can't even go until she passes all her classes. So Wilfried fucks this little issue up by telling Rosemine that she needs to make sure all the first years pass their classes first, and in turn weaponizes the library to do so. That bites him in the ass, because now the library access is on the line, 
She's demanding that all of Arenfest's first years pass their classes on the very first day. Oh man, all those poor lay and med nobles, right? So right after dinner, she begins grinding geography and history into the other students like Ferdinand drilled her, mostly because math and theology should be easy enough to pass. I mean, they've been learning in the playroom, so yeah. Once it's time for the first set of classes, Rosamond goes with her retainers, but they all have to leave as soon as she's safely in class, because the Sovereignty Knights Order is the one that guards the students in the classroom. And it begins with an explanation of how the school works and more to what Rosemind's interested in, how the library works and how she'll need to schedule a meeting with Solange, the uh, head librarian, to register her duchy students. So she's planning to write a letter doing just that during her free period. The fee is high enough that most lay nobles can't afford it, so the school actively encourages arch nobles to give them work for pay. Then there's interduchy socializing, which is encouraged. This is the time to make friends and find marriage partners. So tea parties between other duchies is pretty much expected once classes start to wrap up. Or rather, when most people pass. There's a ton of tea party rooms available since students can't enter another duchy's dorm. Their first class is math, and each class begins with a test. If you pass it, you pass the class, and don't have to waste your time sitting in on the lectures. Great. So one student from each duchy grabs parchment from the professor, and the professor reads the question three times. They're supposed to write it down and give an answer. Now that probably seems like a huge waste of parchment paper, but it really isn't, since they're using mana pens to write things down. At the end of the exam, the professor dips all the parchment in mana dissolving liquid so they're recycled, which is pretty damn smart. So once they finish their tests, Rosemine passes them to the professor, and a few moments later, the teacher calls out all passing grades for Aaronfest. Then it's theology, and that's pretty much a repeat, which is starting to draw some attention from the other duchies, not necessarily positive either. It's not just that they're all passing, but they're finishing first too. After the written classes in the morning for the first years, it's lunch. Then in the afternoon are practical lessons. So they're doing mana control here, which is overseen by Hersher. They just have to fill and drain a face stone to pass. Pretty easy. Practical lessons are divided by rank though, with Archduke candidates doing it with Arch Nobles. So Harenfest only has like three students in the room. They all then get a face stone from Hersher to start. But before Rosemine can even take a seat with hers, it turned to golden dust on her. That's weird. So she gets another, but it turns to golden dust again. Double weird. She tries to mold it like clay, like how she did when she was making Lessie originally, but that's not working out. Wilfried notices she's struggling, but passes his lesson just fine. And at that point, he's gotta go. So he just kinda leaves her there with Hersher. Hersher is wondering what's taking Rosemind so long, because you know, this is Ferdinand's disciple. She shouldn't be taking this long. So she comes on over to see what's up, but immediately sees what the problem is. She's been informed of the magic tools on Rosemind's body, which just so happens to be keeping her enveloped in a strong shell of mana. That's overloading the face stones and turning them to dust, which is fine because that turns out to be a valuable ingredient. So she has her remove one of the bracelets and then she can fill and drain the face stone no problem. Well, not no problem. Her control is wonky because of her mana clumps being dissolved. We already know that. So she shatters a few more and Hersher has to give her quite a few face stones. But eventually she gets the hang of it and passes just fine. So Hersher tells her that her homework will be to learn precision, and then has her turn the rest of those face stones to dust for her trouble. Rosemine then asks her how does she learn precision, but she tells her to ask Ferdinand since he too had a ton of mana. Hersher asks how he's doing by the way, and Rosemine says he's still delving deep into his research and living a much happier life these days, which Hersher's pleased to hear. There's a nice little hint here about how much Hersher cares for Ferdinand. Just this little interaction tells you that he's more than a student to her, but also a friend. And she's pleased that he found a place in his home duchy finally. And this gets elaborated on later because both of them suffered quite a bit, especially under Veronica. She asks when Ferdinand wrote her the letter discussing her circumstances, but it's pretty common knowledge among the professors that she was attacked and in a gerive, because Sylvester had provided documentation in case she needed to attend with a special environment. These special circumstances can be petitioned for by the Archduke, and then granted by the King, and that's how all those blue robes entered the academy to fill the ranks back home. What Hersher knows specifically is that she's Ferdinand's disciple, has magic tools on her that she'll have to account for, because those could interfere with her magecraft lessons, and she has an innovative mind. So basically with all she's heard from Ferdinand and Arenfest students, she's excited to see what Rosemine will accomplish, even if Rosemine's not expecting to live up to the hype. Back in the dorm, Leonor asks Rosemine while she's studying that Bonifatius wants Angelica to marry into his family. And she's like curious for maybe a friend, which of his grandkids she's engaged to. But Rosemine says she hasn't heard anything about it, so it's not Cornelius at least. Hint hint. But even then, she doesn't really see Angelica as first wife material, 
probably because of the whole, like, brain thing. She's second, or let's be honest here, most likely third wife material. Rosamind's ideal of a first wife is Elvira, because she's a woman who gets what she wants. And then Leonor decides at that point to make Elvira her role model as well. About this time, she also gets her reply from Solange. And the meeting is scheduled for four days out, and they'll have to register every new student in the duchy with one small gold coin. Those who can't afford it? Simple. Transcribe books in the library Aaronfest doesn't have, and Rosemine will fork over the deposit for you. With the first round of classes passed, it's time for history, geography, and music. These go pretty much the same as you'd expect, though Roderick and Felina are called up by the professor for history and geography, where they just barely passed. They both asked to get a passing mark regardless, but were offered to come to class anyway and listen to the lectures, so they take the professors up on that. Now for music, Hartmut suggests Rosemine shock everyone even more, you know, after leading her duchy's first years to passing their written classes on their first day, by adding a true blessing on top of her song. But she declines because she doesn't want to stand out any more than she already does. Though everyone in the class has to play a song for the professors to gauge their skill level. It's a little annoying her baseline was Rosina, Ferdinand, and Sylvester, the fucking Archduke, who were all just beyond amazing when she assumed they were the average. But they're not, which means she wasted a bunch of precious reading time practicing Harspiel. Pushing past the insults from Arnsbach as she goes up to play, she decides to play one of her original songs so no one gets bored listening to the same ones over and over again. This draws even more attention to her, because the music professors comment how that's not one they've heard before. So she tries to get away by saying it's not a named song, it's just simply dedicated to Leidenschaft, but Wilfrey pipes up saying the Saint of Arenfest composed that one herself, along with so many others. And that right there pretty much secures her a future invite to a tea party with the music professors. God damn it, Wilfrey. With their classes all passed so far, they decide to go ahead and organize some study guides for next year. Now they're all going to be paid for their work, but the arch nobles aren't really about that life. This gives her an idea that her mana compression method can only be bought with money one earned themselves. She even tells them that she's earned her own money to make the sweets they all enjoy so much. So looking down on earning money isn't a good look. Hell. Guy Baldenzel, another arch-noble, is even investing in the printing industry himself to that end, so that changes their tune. Next is High Beast creation, and Rosamine's changed into riding clothes for it for, like, the first time. She heads on down and remarks to Felina how hard it must have been for her to fill her face down for her High Beast, but she's puzzled by that. You see, lay nobles have their mana from the magic tools saved from the time they're babies, for literally this sort of stuff. High Beast face stones take a ton of mana to fill. So, they've basically been doing it since they were born, essentially. And Rosemine now feels like an ass, saying she did hers in a single sitting. When they're inside, Wilfried points out Rosemine's face stone is light yellow, while his is light green. Here's a bit of world building for you. This right here gives you a good idea of the affinity of one's mana. The lighter the color, the more attributes you have. But Wilfried's is green, meaning he has a slight water preference. Rosemine we know has all the elements, but hers is still slight yellow meaning she has a wind prevalence. Ferdinand's is like an opalescent white, meaning he doesn't really lean in any direction. Then there's lay nobles. They tend to have a very vibrant single color face stone. Their class is taught by a professor named Frau Larm, a shrill woman who happens to be the dorm supervisor for Arnsbach. She has them shape their high beasts like Ferdinand had Rosemine do so long ago now. She encourages them to pick animals they're familiar with, like a family crest or something. Wilfried is talking to Rosemine about his, and he decides to base it on Ferdinand's. Though Sylvester's does come up, but he hasn't seen it. She calls it weird because, you know, it's a three-headed lion, but Frau Larm jumps in and yells at them to shut the hell up. Rosemine decides to contemplate how weird hers is because Wilfried told her she was one to talk, and Frau Larm takes this as laziness and orders her to produce her high beast immediately. So she pops out Lessie and knocks the bitch on her ass. No one's calling it a grunt or ugly or anything, but they do laugh at its shape. Now it's not rideable. Rowlarm does call it a grun, though, and tells her to quit joking around. <laughs> now, as we know, Rosemine isn't, but Frau Larm doubles down, saying she clearly is because she made it a grun. Rosemine declares Lessie to be superior to any other high beast, because he doesn't require riding clothes and can fit multiple people. She accentuates this by growing his size. Then she climbs on in, floats up into the air to prove he can fly, and the simple fact that he flew stunned Frau Larm so much she passed right out. Yeah, she actually needed carried out by knights. That's pretty damn funny. Hersher's called on in to sort out this mess, and she's not fucking happy, so she dismisses the class until a later date. But for the trouble, she demands to see Rosemine's high beast for herself. Now the next class is mana compression, handled by just a fuck ton of professors. But overseeing Rosemine is Hersher again, because of course, 
and a new Professor Ralphin. They have a tool they use to measure mana density, and to pass, pretty much all you have to do is have any change in your mana density. That proves you compressed your mana somewhat. The professors begin to explain the images they use to compress their mana, but nothing's really concrete. Everyone has their own method, and they kind of encourage the students to figure it out for themselves. Wilfrey doesn't really get it, but Rosemind's more worried because she's already compressing her mana, so she's now trying to figure out how to compress it further to pass this class. Wilfried asks her what she does, and she can't really go into it, but the first step isn't what's protected by the magic contract. So she tells him that, but the rest is a secret. She tells him the box stuffing method, which makes him ask just how many steps there are. She says there's just three, and going up to the third was enough to make Ferdinand sick, which stuns Wilfried. Rosemind steps up and has the magic tool strapped to her wrist to measure her density, so now she really does have to figure out how to compress her mana more. She thinks about maybe like a hydraulic press or something squishing it, but then how's she gonna uncompress it from that? That thought alone kinda scares her, because she might just accidentally solidify her mana inside her. So, that concept's out the window. But one of the professors mentioned boiling down a potion, and that makes her realize she could imagine condensing a liquid down like when she's cooking soup. So when they start measuring, she uncompresses her mana, letting it flow freely, and then dumping it into her charms. Which makes her probably stronger than Bonifatius for like, that single moment. Ralphin is yelling to cheer her on like the massive jockey is, which just makes the concentration part a bit harder. She visualizes the boiling, then the folding, then the stuffing, then the squeezing. And when it's all said and done, Hersher is dead silent, staring at the tool in bemusement. After a moment, Ralphin asks if they need to start the test over, but Hersher gives her a passing mark. Yeah, she's done. She heads back to Wilfried, who's clearly focusing, but she tells him to be careful, or else he'll end up with a mana hangover like Ferdinand. So the Archduke candidates in class are fairly used to handling mana, so they tend to do just fine and it's not super dangerous, but the Arch Nobles aren't. When they're up, Suddenly things get a lot more hectic, with people dropping like flies and needing face stones to absorb excess rampaging mana. Rosemind's now worried how the lay nobles are going to fare, but Wilfrey tells her not to. Oswald told him lay nobles have an easier time, since they don't have as much mana to begin with. Back in the dorm, Rosemind is sharing her experience in class with the lay and med nobles, even giving them the freebie with her first step of the mana compression method. When suddenly Hersher burst into the dorm and demands to speak to her. She was so abrupt it required her guard knights to leap into action earning a compliment from Hersher. She ends up taking her up to her room to talk, where she tastes pound cake for the first time, and shows Rosemind the mana density measuring tool. Well, after the room is cleared for them, of course, because this is an important discussion. Now for a bit of fun, she swapped it out for one that's way less sensitive. She originally designed this one to measure Ferdinand's mana. She wants to know exactly what Rosemind did because she far exceeded her expectations. When she told Rosemind to start compressing during class, the needle went all the way to the left which is crazy for a child. Yeah, first it means she was compressing already, but she bottomed out the tool. Then after she started compressing again, she slammed the tool all the way to the right, meaning it was far more dense than the tool could measure. And again, remember, this was calibrated for Ferdinand. This confirms her fourth step actually worked. I mean, a normal person would have just uncompressed their mana before the initial measurement. Yeah, only a gremlin like her would have thought to compress it further. But also, Hersher wants to know how she did that, but she can't really tell her because magic contracts are involved. She's gonna need permission, and Hersher immediately guesses Sylvester, Florencia, Karsta, Elvira, and Ferdinand. But who else is she gonna need permission from? She can easily get that because they all owe her favors. So now Rosemind's a little bit scared of Hersher because she has Aaronfest leaders all under her thumb. She ends the talk saying the things that Rosemind's accomplished so far, and it's not even been a week yet, have her really interested. Well, time for the library. That morning, Rosemine is excited to go, but Brunhilde just remembered after Hersher's sudden appearance that she received a request for a tea party from the music professors. During Brunhilde's music class, it had slipped that Ferdinand sheet music he performed so long ago was widely available in Ehrenfest, so the professors got to hear it from the Ehrenfest students. So it's now well known that Rosemine composed a ton of songs, so they want to talk to her about said songs. This is a huge deal because it's an invitation from the professors, and that's essentially the sovereignty showing interest in Ehrenfest's culture. Brunhilde is over the moon and will accompany Rosemine to the tea party when it's time, but that won't happen until after classes are over. Rosina will accompany them too as her personal musician, but they're gonna need a new song to show off. So Rosemine and Rosina get to work hashing out a new tune, one she'll dedicate to Mestianora, the goddess of wisdom. Well, it's actually the library, but people put a moratorium on that and insist it's just to the goddess herself, or else it's gonna get weird. So they go to the library, 
and Rosemine is excited as hell. She meets this kindly, grandmother-looking woman named Solange. She's the sole librarian, and a med noble of the sovereignty. That's somewhat important later on because it informs the current state of the library itself. Rosemine offers the fee when Solange asks, and the two share a similar sentiment that the library is a gem of knowledge, gifted to them by the gods. After handing over the money and everyone swearing an oath and signing a contract that they won't break the library's rules, Rosemine can't control herself anymore, and despite her promise to leave and only register there, she demands the ability to at least look around. Riarda is against her reading because she still has practical lessons, but her retainers in the first year say she at least deserves to look around, especially because of all the hard work she's put in. When Riarda relents, she praises the gods then and there, and we all know how this goes, so yeah, a blessing fires off, and the two stuffed rabbits we previously had our attention drawn to absorb the blessing and spring to life. They approach Rosemine and call her Milady. Solange is surprised too, but not that there are walking, talking rabbits. Turns out these are ancient magic tools of the library and are finally functional again after so many years. Well, like 10, but still. So yeah, this is Schwartz and Weiss, two magic tools modeled after shoe mills by a now long dead princess and given to the library to maintain it. They require a ton of mana to operate, so Solange couldn't do it. But this was a task previously done by arch-noble librarians. So while all the girls in class, especially Lisa Letta, swoon over the cute stuffed rabbits not quite as tall as Rosemine, she orders them to assist Solange with her work. So they show Rosemine around. She's now even more stoked to come back and read herself. And we learn that Lisa Letta loves shoe mills a ton, which strikes a chord with Rosemine. Where she heard that word before? Can you squeak pee for me? <laughs> God damn it, Sylvester. Yeah, they make this chirping sound and are cute little defenseless rabbits. It's also what Ferdinand told her to model Lessie after originally. The key thing to note about this library is it tends to buy books made by students. Basically, if they have a good enough study guide, the library will purchase it, slap on some wooden boards for a cover, and now it's technically a book. The first floor is almost exclusively that, but the second floor has chain books that are the real deal, and there are a ton of scrolls that were researched for students and professors alike. Those tend to be on the older side though, since most keep that shit a secret until they die. There's a lot of magic tools the library uses too, like instead of bells chiming for students to know when to pack their shit up, the lights will change color because they're more noticeable, plus there's temperature and humidity controls too. Rosemine asks about Schwartz and Weiss before they leave, since a talking magic tool is really unique, and yeah, they're very rare. In fact, the method used to make these two isn't known and was lost long ago. They'll always address their master as Milady too, since it's presumably a woman who made them. She also learns that many students don't return their books, because they can just afford to lose the deposit, which comes up later on. When they have to leave the library finally, Schwartz and Weiss want praise. That means stroking their face stones and pouring some mana inside. Further, they ask when they're getting new clothes. It's tradition that when they get a new master, they get new outfits prepared, which not only takes time, but also requires magical charms. Because again, these are highly valuable magic tools that anyone would want to steal and examine. Well, time to knock out their next practical lesson, Chord Etiquette. They have a mock tea party with a professor named Primavera, the embodiment of your stereotypical noble woman. But since etiquette changes based on status, this class is split up by Arch, Med, and Lay, even though it has nothing to do with mana. They're basically holding this mock tea party with a royal, so the Archduke candidates have it rough because they're just kind of assuming they need to know the greetings and such to get by. But the teacher warns them that candidates tend to get a little slack. Since they outrank everyone else in their home duchy, they tend to slip into impolite mannerisms. So after the first few candidates, ones from upper ranked duchies who fail to get passing marks when just greeting a royal, they have to retry, which sends murmurs through the lower ranking duchies. Initially, Rosemine was told that this class would be pretty easy, since etiquette teachers are usually pretty lax, but that's probably for lower status individuals. Behind Primavera, other professors are making notes on the students, and when the tea party ends for upper ranking duchies, she issues them their warnings and grades. So Rosemine and Wilfried are up, and Rosemine's planning to stick to Elvira's teachings. Wilfried gives his greeting first, and has to do it again, and then he's dismissed with less than stellar reviews. Rosemine's up now and gives her greeting, and even she's told to retry. So she turns her politeness up to 11, and gets passing marks to join the tea party. On the way to her seat, she whispers to Wilfried to imagine that Ferdinand is watching, and suddenly he's wearing a stiff, bright, noble smile. She's escorted to her seat by an attendant, but they pull out the chair for her and she can't exactly climb up. That's not ladylike. 
She does what she usually does in this situation, but she gets no response this time. Now she's faced with two options here. This is either a test to see how she handles this situation, or the attendant here is just dumb. When everyone's seated, she finally asks Premavera if she's really meant to treat this tea party as though it's hosted by a royal. After some confirmation, she then asks if this attendant's new, because they're making a pretty obvious mistake. But she says don't scold them too much because it's hard to find good help these days. That little comment alleviates responsibility from the host. So Premavera swaps out the attendants and has Rosemine hoisted up into her seat. This was indeed part of the exam, as there were a bunch of manufactured issues that cropped up during the tea party to see how everyone handled them. But in the end, Rosemine and Wilfrey both pass. When they're back in the common room, Hersher bursts in yet again, asking to hear about Schwartz and Weiss, of course, which are a researcher's wet dream. Rosemine's wondering why she thinks she revived them of all people, but Hersher can indeed put two and two together. She begs Rosemine to let her sit in and watch when they're being measured, but she promises not to touch. Why? Because the charms and how these two tools move is incredibly high-level magecraft, and as a professor specializing in magic tool creation, she's chomping at the bit to discover as much as she can about them. Remember, their master is usually an arch-noble librarian who doesn't even lead the library, so it's incredible she's even getting this chance. She offers Rosemine a deal here to ensure she gets her viewing chance. She'll personally oversee her High Beast creation class. You know, the one that was rescheduled after Frau Larm's collapse? Basically ensuring she won't be failed out of spite. So, she doesn't even have a choice. So this next bit's probably a big deal and has a ton of lore implications, but there's not any real answers as of yet. At least when I'm making this video. So understand that this one scene is probably really important, just based off of how the writer writes her story. But I can't offer you any answers as of yet. So I guess we'll revisit this later on. Probably. So Rosemine's pretty much down to just a few practical lessons left, but this next one's a big one. But before that even happens, she's helping Hartmut organize the Scholar Course study guides, and also learning from it herself. He's curious about why she's interested, and she says she plans on becoming a librarian, having already discussed this with Ferdinand. Hartmut's surprised she's not aiming for Ob though, but she just dismisses the idea outright, even telling him that if he's worried about his future career, she'll let him go without any hard feelings. But enough of that. It's finally time for Rosemine to get her stop. So the question on your mind is, why is that a big deal? Turns out, stops are the most efficient thing for precisely controlling mana. Many have tried to invent a better magic tool and failed. So it's a huge deal to get one because it's the first step in being recognized as a noble. It used to happen during one's third year, but after the purge, the king changed the time when it was acquired. This class consists of simply fetching an item called a divine will and returning from it. That's all it takes to pass the class. This is their last class of their first week, right before the day off for a reason. And yeah, everything so far that's blown the professors away has taken place in a single week. So every single first year gathers in the auditorium, and in the back of that is a chapel with an altar like the temple in Aaronfest. This is called the farthest hall. Premavera opens the door, leading to a natural cave inside the hill the academy is built on. Students will go inside, find their divine will, and then exit. Now they shouldn't touch anyone once they have it because that could contaminate their divine will. And they only have one chance to gather it too. There's a path in and out. So the highest in status go first. Despite the natural cave, there is an ivory path paved the whole way. Rosemine walks and walks and walks, but there's really nothing of note. Eventually she realizes she's holding Wilfrey back and tells him to go on ahead without her because she's getting a little tired at this point, despite pouring a ton into her enhancement bracelets. Eventually Roderick catches up, despite coming in long after she did, and she tells him to go on ahead too. But suddenly he shouts that he sees something. He races off and picks up… air? She can't see what he's holding, but he's definitely holding something. He then excuses himself and walks back along the opposite path to leave. So Rosemine just has to keep going further ahead. And eventually she starts to see the Archnobles walking back, cradling something invisible as well. And before long, she sees Wilfried on his way back too. And he's surprised she's all the way back there. He tells her she's still got a long way to go yet before she ends up hitting where the Archduke candidates found their wills. So Rosemine keeps walking and walking and walking, and it's just more and more cave. Climbing even sets the stairs until eventually she happens upon a spiral staircase. Now that seems really out of place. She climbs that too and finds a chamber with an ivory tree at the center. Nestled at its base, she sees a twinkling rainbow face stone. Immediately she knows it's what she's looking for. 
Rose's mind reaches out for it, and it floats into her hand. She hugs it to her chest and heads on her merry way. But along the way back, she's getting seriously tired at this point. When she tries to pour more mana into her charms, the Divine Will absorbs it instead. <laughs> While that blows, she stuck the charms at their current speed, and it's a little slower than she'd like. She's now so exhausted that she needs to sit and rest, but ends up passing out instead. Suddenly she comes to with a shout from Ralphen, who's calling out to her. All the professors came in to find her when she didn't come back, but they didn't want to touch her in case she found her divine will. And since she's on that side of the path, they knew they better not. So she has to hobble her way back out of the cave, tired, and she's really starting to feel sick at this point. When she gets to the entrance, she asks if she can use her high beast. And it turns out the Primavera can actually give permission for that, but she probably won't be able to, since her divine will is going to suck up the mana she tries to use anyway. But if she can make it appear, they'll let her ride it to the dorm. Rose Mind Brute forces her mana into Lessie anyway, and he's a bit slower than usual, but she does make it back to the dorm. Oh yeah, and all the professors were gawking and asking her questions about Lessie too, despite her condition. Riarda just decides to risk it by using some mana blocking gloves to get her changed and thrown into a bath, that way she can wash off all the dirt because she couldn't exactly go to bed after falling asleep in a cave. Then she gives her a potion and leaves. Now that she's back in her room, she looks at the Divine Will and it's now small enough to hold in one hand. As she pours more mana into it, it's clearly starting to fuse with her body. Hence why we see nobles pull stops out of literally nowhere, because as it turns out, it's a part of them. Hey, that's also why they use magic tools to seal them. Also, first years have to spend the next day absorbing their divine wills anyway, which is why they do this the day before Earth's Day, the like national day off. So after sleeping that night and waking up to breakfast in her chambers alone, Rosemine isn't allowed to leave or even read. That sucks. But a thought does cross her mind. This process would probably go a hell of a lot faster without her enhancements. So she takes one off her arm and the Divine Will shrinks before her eyes into her hand. So that went a lot quicker than expected. That means she has a stop herself now, right? So she closes her eyes and thinks about what a stop looks like. She imagines it in her dominant hand and when she opens her eyes, there it is. Neat. Since magic is so dependent on mental images, Rose Mind thinks about a mage staff and decides to transform it into that. Which is cool because hey, it works. But then she realizes pretty quickly that it's a pain to swing around for spells. And noticing that no other adults have huge stops? Yeah. She quickly settles on a standard wand shape because it's honestly the most convenient to use. I think this next part is pretty neat because we've seen stops since part 2 and they're always wands. And I like the implication here that people have probably tried more unwieldy designs and shapes, but eventually everyone just settles on the wand because it's easiest to use and requires the least amount of mana. It's a nice bit of forethought to say, hey, this is why they're wand shaped, because it's simple, practical, and resource efficient. Bet you weren't expecting an actual explanation for why that is. Not many other series would go ahead and give you a good reason why their wands are wands. When Riarda comes back with lunch, she's still not letting Rosemine out, even though her fever is gone and Divine Will absorbed, because she still needs rest. Though she'll let her go down for dinner if she behaves, which we know she won't. As soon as Riarda returns, she finds Rosemine with a book in her hands, and yeah, scolds her for it. But putting that aside, it's a good time to have a serious talk, since, you know, they're both alone. She asks Rosemine if she really doesn't intend to become the next Archduke. She says she doesn't, even if she does have a legitimate claim to the seat. Not just is Wilfried no longer guaranteed to be the next Archduke, Riarda says her bloodline is fine too, since Karstadt's grandfather was the Archduke himself. But yeah, Rosemine keeps it to herself that there's actually a massive fucking issue with her bloodline. However, she has to confirm Rosemine's intentions. And when she does, Riarda isn't upset, but rather does her job as Rosemine's head attendant. She'll clear up any misconceptions and stop her retainers from pushing her into the role. <laughs> now, if only it were just her retainers. However, once dinner rolls around, she gets downstairs and asks her retainers what they did that day. Her knights played did her for practice, and Rosemine asks what it really is, because Eckhart's explanation wasn't great besides... a game? And Traugott fills in Angelica's barely better explanation, by stating there's actually different kinds that measure different skills. The treasure-stealing variety used to be the most popular, but lately it's all about speed ditter, which is where a professor summons a fey beast and the students kill it as quickly as possible. It's played during the Interduchy tournament, so Rosemine's looking forward to it. But Traugott's busy foreshadowing by darkly saying they'll do well with Angelica and Cornelius on their team, 
with a pissy little expression on his face. She then goes on over to her attendants, and they're all gathered around with the girls, and they're all having fun. Great. Rosemine asks what they're up to, and they're all ashamed they started without her. Turns out they were busy designing clothes for Schwartz and Weiss. We'll see in Lisa Letta's side story that she's sweating bullets right here, because she inadvertently is saying here that she knows better than her lady by deciding to do her lady's job for her without her input. Yeah, kinda shitty. Luckily, Rosemine is Rosemine, and she's just happy for the input, and instead of punishing them, asks if everyone there would like to accompany her for measuring the outfits, assuming they all finish their classes before they go, that is. So yeah. All the girls in the dorm are suddenly excited, but Lisa Letta herself, aside from loving shoe mills, actually has some experience making clothes for them. Angelica informs us that she raises them at home and makes cute little outfits for them, much to her embarrassment. So with that, the next practical lesson is the dedication rule for the Archduke candidates. It's a shared class among all the grades since they all need to know how to do it for their graduation ceremony. Yeah, knights practice the sword dance, while everyone else will practice instruments. And no, not just the harspiel. We learn here that Angelica was recommended for the sword dance by Ralphin, despite her garbage grades. This is usually a spot reserved for Arch Knight honor students. Judith mentions how pretty unlikely it is that anyone from Ehrenfest is chosen at all, especially when an entire duchy is focused on knights. But Angelica was picked, Cornelius will probably get chosen, and Judith doesn't think she has a chance. But Leonor and Traugott just might, if they learn her compression method, that is. Traugott mentions again that he really wants to learn her method, that way he might be chosen. Which, I don't know if you're counting, or if I've even been including these little tidbits in the story at this point. It's like the second or third time he's brought it up, and again, it's a little over a week at this point, so the dude's sounding like a broken record. In class, Rosemine is watching the older students practice. For the younger ones, they merely need to demonstrate their trying. They have a ways to go before they really need to take it seriously. One girl draws Rosemine's attention, though, as she's dressed to play the part of the goddess of light in this dance. Prince Anastasius is playing the god of darkness, and hey, it turns out there's a prayer that's meant to be said during this dance. This is Rosemine's first time hearing it, but the girl who's playing the goddess of light really knocks Rosemine away with how good she is. Anastasius is lacking in comparison, but you know, she's not stupid enough to say that out loud. About this time, a wild dead Lind appears and approaches Wilfried. She chats him up about his efforts leading his duchy to passing their classes, and he tries to say that was all Rosemine, but... She's hearing none of it. She reaches out, strokes his forehead, and deliberately says that he's done well and is her pride and joy. Yeah, that's pretty weird. It's also probably something Veronica used to say to him when he was being praised. And with how Detland looks, yeah, he gets a little flustered. Now I'm gonna explain this because that probably seems even more weird because, gross. But this is a world where half-siblings from different mothers can legally get married and have kids no problem. I mean, with seemingly no genetic defects. They look fine, they act fine, they're healthy enough. Must be because of mana. So let's just be clear, in-universe, this is her blatantly hitting on him in public. Again, gross by our standards, not by theirs. So she invites him to a tea party for cousins, and Rosemine begrudgingly takes the role of being the socially inept ass to try and invite herself along. Also, she can protect Wilfried, but Detlind isn't going to go with the flow here, and flat out refuses, stating emphatically that she's not her family. I mean, that's not entirely true. They're second cousins, first by adoption, but sure. We know how thick blood has to be in this world, apparently. Enter the absolute Chad Rudiger to invite himself along, because if Wilfried is family, he sure as shit is too. Yeah, Detlin can't refuse him like she did Rosemine, so he's going too. Seeing she's been excluded, Rosemine fucks off, but gets called to by Anastasius. Well, that's random. He asks her about her high beast that apparently attacked for alarm, so he wants to see it to determine if it's safe. She uses the dedication world class as an excuse to put it off, saying she'll need better bait than a weird high beast to entice him. So she vows right then and there never to approach him after showing him her high beast, and that she promises to never speak to him again. Which just leaves the prince confused. But sure, after he leaves, Wilfried asks what the hell that was about, and she tells him that she promised to show Anastasius her high beast. It's time for the first years to practice after that, and Rosemine passes. Hooray, but immediately tries to bail on class. Luckily, Wilfried caught her and reminded her about her promise to a goddamn prince, so she waits outside the class with Riarda. When he comes out, though, he says he has other business to attend to, 
so her high beast will have to wait. With his groupies clearly pleased, they deflected yet another love rival, <laughs> which Rosemine wasn't in the first place. She tells him that it's no problem at all, and doesn't even look back when she goes to leave. So now that most of her classes are done, Rosemine passes music officially, mentions to her professors how excited she is for the tea party, and Wilfrey comments how good she is at music, having passed with little effort. I mean, that's not true. The song they gave her to learn to pass the class is one that Ferdinand gave her ages ago, and if Wilfried learned the harp spiel with her, he'd be in the same boat as well. Also probably miserable. She's also working on study guides and polishing the stories kids wrote for her while she was asleep. That way she'll have some stuff to print when winter's over. So she's far from taking it easy. But it's at this point she realizes just how much the classes have changed since Ferdinand attended. That's because most of the staff was replaced, and teachers want to make an impact or just teach their own way. So they'll basically redo the whole curriculum when a new teacher takes over. So as they're finishing the study guides, Felina wants to socialize and gather info for Rosemine as soon as possible. And that means Rosemine should probably start thinking about that too. They'll need to figure out what is and isn't okay to talk about. Hartmut chimes in to say their rising grades will definitely be a topic of discussion, because even he's getting asked about it. Also, the whole Saint of Arenfest thing is probably going to come up, because Rosemine's also been a big topic of discussion so far. While she's focusing on the bad, like the rumors of her high beast and collapsing in the farthest hall, Hartmut is simply telling everyone that their grades are due to her, and they can all expect more to come. He uses this as an example of being selective with your information as a tip for Felina. Hey, now it's time to pass high beast creation officially now. And Frau Arm isn't about to let her do that, but Hersher and a group of other professors show up in the name of safety. They gather around Rosemine to observe her high beast because they're all from the scholar course. When Rosemine pops out Lessie, they're excited and even climb inside. Hersher remarks how this proves some concepts, and she could even create her own based on this design. So she does, creating a carriage high beast with a shoemill head using reins instead of a steering wheel. The girls in class say how cute it is, and it's clearly a new trend about to be born. So having usurped Frau Larm's authority over the class, and ensuring her bias won't fail Rosemine, all the kids have to do is fly a lap around the school to pass. So Rosemine does, seeing they're on a hilltop surrounded by a forest. She can't really tell which dorm is which from the outside yet, but when she lands, she gets her passing grade. Hooray. One left. Next is her last practical lesson. She taught fundamentals with Hersher and Raufen again. Now before she went, Hartmut even told her it's not so simple, and Archduke candidates rarely pass on their first try, so he pretty much tells her to give up. But she won't with the library on the line. She charges in, and their first task is to produce their stop and then demonstrate that to the teacher three times in quick succession. You know that question posed back during the baptism in like part three, volume two? Rosemine was wondering why people were clapping when Felina had her mana measured. This is it. We learned that that mana measuring is to ensure people have enough mana to actually claim a divine will. The lore is that the first king was granted his stop by the gods in order to control his overflowing mana. That way he could use it however he wished. That bit just happens to be in the Bible, and Rosemine's not sure how accurate it is. But judging by everything else in the Bible being pretty damn accurate, she's fairly confident it's pretty true. Now she's already played with her stop a bit, and yeah, that sounds kinda dirty, but she demonstrates that she can manifest it to Hersher while everyone else is figuring out what theirs should even look like. Hersher's a bit exasperated she was practicing on her own, but allows her to go through the next part of the test with Raufen. So her first ever spell will be to make one we're all very familiar with at this point, an Ordnance. So she follows him and he pulls out a face stone, which is actually a brood magic tool, and tells her to fill it with a bit of mana and chant the magic word. Now that she's using her stop though, Rosemine feels the difference in control. It turned her bucket dumping metaphor into a faucet. So she precisely pours the minimal amount of mana into the tool, and out pops the magic bird. When its mouth opens, Rosemine can say her message. But before she sends it off, he tells her that she can add on to it by tapping its beak with her stop to open its mouth again. If she wants to start over though, she just needs to pull out her mana. That's why they needed to know how to do that. She records and to send it off, she just needs to swing her stop while picturing the bird flying off to its intended target. So it flies across the room and soon enough, she gets her reply from Hersher saying go on to the next thing, which just so happens to be shooting mana out of the stop. This can be a simple magic attack like we've seen before, but this is also how rote works, and that's specifically what they're teaching here. He tells her to pour all she can in and release it all at once up at the ceiling. 
since ivory buildings are impervious to mana attacks, so she won't accidentally cause damage or summon the Knight's Order. But she decides to ignore his advice and pour just a little bit in, and fire off a fairly unimpressive road. But she gets a passing mark, and has one last trial left. But Ralphin is concerned if she has enough mana for this. Most students tend to be tired as hell at this point, and is why Archduke candidates don't pass on their first try, most likely. She looks back at the rest of the students, barely standing, since most of them wasted their mana trying to make a cool stop, and the ones who didn't are working on the Ordnance step. But she's fine because she's been monitoring her mana, on top of the huge amount she already has. So yeah, she has the choice here, call it quits, or be abnormal and pass on her first try. And with the library on the line, she goes for it, obviously. So her last step is turning her stop into useful magic tools for gathering, brewing, and writing magic circles. So she does all those, and Hershers join them at this point to walk her through it. When she's done, she's passed her class. And Hersher mentions the last person to do this was, you guessed it, Ferdinand. That sends a stir through the class, as suddenly everyone starts talking about him like an urban legend. But they're confused since some heard he was a knight, some heard about his amazing musical talents, while others claim that he was a scholar. Little did they know, all those stories were true, and Rosemine's been outed as his disciple, which explains a lot to the other duchies. The epilogue is from her guardian's perspective, as they get report after report about the academy. They're getting him from two sources, Wilfried and Hersher. The reports from her in the past were pretty much garbage, but by the time classes start, she's asking Sylvester more questions than actually giving answers. Moral of the story here is, they're all sick just reading these disasters, where Rosemine shoved Rinsham in everyone's faces, pushed all the first years to pass their classes on the first day, her music compositions impressed the music teachers so much they invited her to a tea party, her high beast attacking Frau Larm, becoming Schwartz and Weiss's master, and then collapsing in the farthest hall. By that point, he calls Ferdinand to look over this shit, and he laughs at how bad these reports are, because the ones he's getting from Wilfried have much more detail. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, Ferdinand was getting questions from Wilfried, which turned into reports. So Sylvester asks what the hell is happening, and Ferdinand points out this is the result of dangling the library over her head. Wilfried's responsible here, and has no one to blame but himself. But for Schwartz and Weiss? Well, they're stumped because they don't really know the state of the library at this point. When the next report comes saying Rosemine made contact with Anastasius and almost ditched him, they're absolutely terrified. But not just over that. When Ferdinand mentions the Arnsbach Tea Party, Sylvester is shitting a brick. But Ferdinand points out that if he can't handle it, he'll just prove himself a fool, and would never survive as the Archduke. So let him handle it, because even Ferdinand has some faith in him. But for now, they're just hoping Rosemine doesn't cause any more problems. Well, let me just say, they haven't seen nothing yet. Jeez, what a monster. We made it through the volume, but there's still side stories to cover. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of blow through them because they're more flavor and background this time around, rather than having deeper lore implications. So let's go ahead and finish this up. First is a productive Earth Day from Lisa Letta's perspective, and details the lives of Rosemine's retainers. Specifically, we see her and Angelica's living situation. They're med nobles, so they're generally too poor to afford a single room. They tend to double up to save on heating, food, and such. But what may interest people here? They have attendants themselves, two older family members whose kids have already grown up. Hell, even Felina has someone as an attendant to help out. Oh, and uh, she's rooming with Judith, by the way. That's an interesting tidbit. By the way, Brunhilde and Leonor are in single rooms because they're arch nobles. But Lisa Letta is going to have her own room starting next year, after Angelica finally graduates. The story details her one day off while Rosemine is filling her divine will. So Angelica plays Ditter, like we knew, but she's a little late getting up and has to study a bit beforehand. So while that's happening, Lisa Letta and her attendants talk about how close they were to seeing Angelica fail school, meaning she would have been strapped with the stop sealing magic tool and demoted all the way down to servant of her family. Yeah, that's the punishment for failing school, not becoming a noble and dropping down in status to that of a commoner servant. So on that note, we see what happens on everyone's day off, and it ends with Rosemine startling Lisa Letta while designing outfits like we saw. Next is Mine Awakes from Effa's perspective, all the way back at the start of the volume. Lutz and Tuli come bursting in after Effa and Camille were out shopping. She's helping him build up strength and endurance so he can go to the forest by himself. Now he's not sickly like Mine was, but he's still like three at this point, so he needs a bit of work. So they come in and tell Effa that Mine's awake, and they're both super excited. 
Effa zones out at that, assuming it was a dream, but when the discussion shifts to what Lutz and Tuli want to do now that she's awake, it sinks in that this is real. But a real downer hits when Camille asks, who's mine? They get silent and brush the issue off. But Effa sends Lutz out the door to tell Gunther and gives him a little pocket money to stay out at the bar late. That way they can talk when he gets home after Camille's asleep. When he does show up, it's time for a family meeting. Minus Camille, of course, who's asleep. They agree not to tell him about mine because he's at that age where secrets aren't really keepable for him, so they really don't see a reason to tell him. He'll need to put two and two together on his own, and hopefully after he's older. If he asks them again, they'll simply say Lutz and Tuli found something of mine, his now dead older sister, and it made them excited. Sorry to blast through those so quick, but this video is getting long enough and I still have to get into my final thoughts. Not that there's really much else to say. I've already talked about the cool lore tidbits and touched on the foreshadowed events throughout this video, but let's go ahead and get a bit more general. Another start to new part, and that means the usual slew of changes in Rosemine's life. Where in part 2 she suddenly got a whole host of religious and high class expectations thrust upon her, part 3 gave her a huge slap in the face for what nobles actually are and how they have to behave. Part 4 is really about showing her what's expected to someone with what amounts to the second strata of power behind the royal family. In the academy, she's treated with the assumption that she could be the Archduke of Arenfest one day. That means everyone expects her to act a certain way and understand the implications of her actions. That's the biggest cause of issues for her in this entire part. She looks and talks like a noble, but the direction she charges off in, the implications of her word choice, and scale of who she's now socializing with creates huge ripples. Sylvester's aching stomach in the epilogue is a sign of things to come, because Rosemine wasn't even socializing yet. Hooray. Speaking of socializing, nobles of different duchies need to interact, obviously, as not only are they attending the academy together, but making friendships and rivalries is heavily encouraged. Those bonds have reaching implications outside of school. Say when you're looking for a marriage partner, or you're the first wife of an archduke and need to reach out to an old friend you used to talk to in the academy, that way you can exchange some information. Or even if you're a retainer of the archduke himself. You may need to use your connections to inform political decisions of your lord. That's why socializing in the academy is so important, but the issue tends to come up among the hierarchy, because this world needs one. Their whole society is built upon it. Social cues require a hierarchy in this world, because otherwise, how would any archduke know who's higher in status, or needs to listen to the other? This is where the ranks come up. And I like how it's handled in this story too, because it's not a power scale. The military might of the entire country isn't the first ranked duchy, it's actually the cultural hub. The duchy most known for its scholars and research is actually number three, and is a very real threat of taking the first or second place of spot. The ranks are evaluated on a yearly basis at the Archduke Conference, showing mobility, and is based on a ton of factors that show if a duchy strives to improve, they can see those results in their status. But I think the most useful aspect of duchy rank isn't just in terms of Archdukes talking. It matters a ton even back home, when receiving requests from neighbors. Arenfest can decline from Beltag because they're 15, but Arensbach is number 6, so they have to listen. A visiting noble can outrank everyone in the duchy of their rank, and lower because they're from a duchy that's of a higher rank, which is the most practical application we see in the Royal Academy. Arch nobles will always outrank med and lay nobles. We know this. So an arch noble of the 21st ranked duchy is still of higher status than a lay noble of the first. But arch nobles of a lower ranked duchy will need to see ground to arch nobles of a higher ranked duchy. This is why we saw Sylvester kneel to Georgine, but lord over Bindewald with his status. This comes up throughout the next two parts, where the rank of duchies involved play a huge part, as Rosemine sets her sights on socializing with those beyond Arenfest to build its new trends. An interesting point I want to revisit is stops are gotten during the first year of the Royal Academy now. You might be wondering why certain magic tools exist in the first place, because it's pretty much unheard of for pre-academy children to need to gather ingredients or brew potions. Rosemine was an exception. So like the knife for gathering, or stick Rosemine used to brew her gerive, seem incredibly redundant when you learn to make those in the second week of the Academy using your stop, which is far better at controlling mana. We know that. It's honestly even more weird when you realize you don't even brew or gather anything that requires those tools in the first place in your first year, but the answer is quite simple. Stops used to be acquired in one's third year, when spells became more commonly used in classes. Hell, basic brewing for rejuvenation potions and ordinances, because again, those need to be brewed, 
and yes, Rosemine will make those later in the series, are all taught in the second year. So these would have been tools kids made probably early in their first or second year to gather until they received their stops in their third. So I think it's kind of neat that Ferdinand, Eustace, and Eckhart probably didn't know the current state of the academy. So like imagine Ferdinand giving her this knife and broomstick thinking he's preparing her for class because that would have been necessary when he went to school, but then she comes back with her stop and didn't need them at all. Not that he would care, because he'd just start making her do harder stuff using her stop. It's a nice bit of attention to detail that the writer wrote these tools into existence, but we find out they're not necessary, and it's not exactly spelled out why they exist, but left to the implications that, if you think about it, that hey, these would have been used in the academy lessons when students didn't get their stops until their third year. Details like that make the world feel bigger and more alive, because it's all consequences rather than a conscious decision. These things didn't fall out of favor because they're inefficient. The curriculum changed, and as a consequence of that, they're not used anymore. And no, no teacher even talks about that because why would they? But hey, it's time to talk about everyone's favorite plot contrivance. So the time skip this volume probably seems pretty lazy. I mean, they usually are, but I'm confident saying here it's not. The reason why time skips are usually seen as lazy is the characters progress off page without the reader seeing their struggles or grow. But the reason it's effective here is the audience isn't the one skipping ahead. In fact, Rosemind's the one who skipped. We, the audience, saw in the side stories how much the world moved without her. She gained zero benefit from her long slumber. At least not yet, because she's actually in a worse off spot than before she went under. Essentially, we didn't just skip until Rosemind was competent. In fact, she's arguably less competent than before, because she's now in a place where her actions have more direct consequences, while still lacking the social tact to understand what the hell she's even doing, on top of her reliance on magic tools to even move her limbs. The world left her behind with yet another huge shift in her life, right as she was getting comfortable again. And that's one of the aspects that keep this story fresh for me, is every time Rosemine is getting comfortable and things are starting to look up for her, she's hit with a debilitating challenge that forces her to change her life in a massive way. She went from being a commoner inventor to a blue shrine maiden when she accidentally outed herself to the nobility for books. Then she went from creating books at her leisure, to the adopted daughter of the Archduke after drawing the ire of nobles to protect her family, and now after getting a handle on living as a noble daughter, she was pretty much just thrown into the future from her perspective, with a worse off condition that has to embody the Saint of Ehrenfest on a national stage. So this time skip was definitely for a narrative purpose, and one that has lasting impacts on not just the story, but Rosemine herself. So that's finally it. Part 4 of Volume 1 is done, and it was a monster to get through. Not because of the huge lore implications or anything, that comes later, but just because Rosemine did a lot. And again, this was not even her first two weeks at the Academy. The core cast begins to balloon at this point in the story, because yeah, the core cast expands in each part, but now Rosemine has a ton of retainers, new friends at school, and new enemies to watch out for. But we'll find out more in the next volume, as her happy little school life comes to a head, when she receives summons from a prince. But for now though, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description. If you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Honorable Zero One and Robin DBL for their continued support. Thanks for watching.